Clayton Bankson, welcome to the University of Saskatchewan College of Law. Before I introduce today's special guest, some acknowledgements are in order. The first is our acknowledgement that we are on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nation and the Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Next, I would like to thank our lecture series sponsor, the McCurcher Law Firm, whose financial support makes events like this possible. Thank you to McCurcher for your support and engagement with our lecture series. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Kendall Thomas. Kendall is a Nash Professor of Law at Columbia Law School and the Director of the Center for the Study of Law and Culture. He was raised and attended public schools in Oroville, California, before going on to study at Yale College and Yale Law School in New Haven, Connecticut. At Columbia, Professor Thomas teaches courses in U.S. constitutional law, law and sexuality, critical race theory, and human rights. He also works on projects at the intersection of culture and law. Human Rights, a performance installation project he created with the celebrated choreographer William Forsyth, has been performed in Germany, Belgium, Switzerland, Sweden, and Turkey. I can personally attest, as a former student of our esteemed guest, that he's an outstanding law professor and very engaging. So I very much look forward to his talk today. His presentation is titled, Branding the Dream, Racial Democracy and Constitutional Politics in the Age of Obama. The talk is part of a larger book project of the same title on law, culture, and politics in the age of racial neoliberalism. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the College of Law, Professor Kendall Thomas. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, I have one of those big law professor voices anyway, so I'm not sure I need this mic. Um, I'm going to, Clayton, I thought I had brought this. Uh, huh. thought I had brought my phone with me. Here it is which will help me keep time because I understand that a number of our students need to get back to class, um, get out of here in time to get to class at uh, 1. So uh, I am delighted to be here and I'd like to thank Professor Bengtson uh, as well as Professor Wanda Wiegers uh, and uh, most of all Katie Riley who uh, helped with the logistics of getting me here to stand before you this afternoon to talk uh, about racial democracy and constitutional politics in the age of Obama. The larger project from which uh, this talk is taken uh, attempts really to make sense of the last eight or so years uh, in American po political life from the point of view of someone who teaches at a university law school and who's interested in the intersection of law and culture. As Clayton told you, I direct a Center for the Study of Law and Culture. And for me, the framework that culture offers for understanding legal ideas and legal institutions is indispensable to uh, a deep grasp and a full engagement uh, with the large issues of our time. For me, uh, the word culture is a word that refers not so much to high culture, uh, string quartets or the opera. Uh, as I use the term, the term is meant to capture that dimension of the law which is principally concerned with the production of meanings, uh, with what the theorists would call the semiotics of law, uh, how law engages over and above uh, the work it does in resolving disputes or facilitating social uh, relations and market transactions, how law also engages in the work of representation, that is to say, in the active work 
of making things mean. And one of the central, although not exclusive, sites of this semiotic dimension of the law, of this practice of making the law mean over and above its instrumental work, is constitutional law, is constitutional law. So I'm going to begin uh, with an idea with which some of you may be familiar, those of you who are students of constitutionalism generally and American constitutional uh, law in particular. I'm going to begin with an idea that was first developed by my colleague Professor Akhil Amar in his book on the U.S. Constitution. And Professor Amar, in his book, The Unwritten Constitution, argues that in the U.S. we have several constitutions. One important constitution that lawyers typically don't talk too much about, argues Amar, is the symbolic constitution. The symbolic constitution. And this is an unwritten constitution which is reflected uh, not just in decisions uh, by courts and others, but is also present in the everyday life of the law and in American political culture more generally. So, Amar argues that Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is part of our symbolic constitution. He argues that Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech from 1963 uh, is part of our symbolic constitution. And I very much like this idea of a symbolic constitution if it's not restricted as Amar sometimes confines it to what the legal scholar David Strauss has called documentarianism. That is to say, if it doesn't focus solely on texts. So take, for example, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which was delivered on a field of battle, or King's 1963 March on Washington, I Have a Dream speech, which was delivered on the Washington Mall. Both of those were not only, not even principally, texts of the kind that one reads. They weren't produced to be read, but they were speeches. And in that regard, I want to modify Amar's notion of the symbolic constitution by suggesting to you uh, that we have as well in the U.S. and uh, indeed uh, in Canada a performative constitution, a constitution which is defined by public performance uh, and one of whose uh, chief ingredients is rhetoric. And so, um, I use this idea of the age of Obama to invite you to an understanding of that aspect of U.S. symbolic constitutionalism, of the performative constitution, right, which can be seen in the exercise of presidential power as rhetorical power. Right? So I want to talk a bit about the constitutional significance of the Obama presidency as part of a broader history that the political scientist Jeffrey Toulis has called the rhetorical presidency. I'm stacking up several ideas at once. Symbolic constitution, one component of which is its performative uh, public dimension, you might even say, its public expressive dimension, right? and trying to take this notion of the symbolic constitution, a cultural idea, and connect it to the notion of a rhetorical presidency. President Obama has been called, among other things, the great orator. Some refer to him as our orator-in-chief. And much of the conduct of his presidency has occurred in those very important occasions on which he has addressed the nation as a whole. Many of those pronouncements, as you know, have taken place around the vexed issue of race and issues of racism 
And it is that aspect of the Obama presidency about which I want to talk to you uh, today. So I begin by suggesting to you that viewed as a rhetorical presidency, the Obama administration has contributed in ways that set it apart from preceding administrations to the transformation of that aspect of symbolic constitutionalism in the United States, to that aspect of our cultural constitution, which is about race. And he has done so principally by offering us three distinctive conceptions of race that we've seen before, but have not seen combined in quite the way that Mr. Obama has put them together. And I call these respectively, uh, here we'll see if my PowerPoint is going to work. We're doing pretty good so far. Ethnic race, moral race, and market race. Ethnic race, moral race, and market race. I begin with the concept of ethnic race and a brief account of the ways in which the Obama presidency is a presidency which has been characterized by an ethnicizing of race. And I call attention here to the first of the defining speeches that Mr. Obama gave on the subject of race before he was president, in fact, a speech in March 2008 at Philadelphia's Convention Center after he was forced to address a controversy during the presidential campaign involving the pastor of his church, the Reverend Jeremiah Wright of Chicago. In the speech, the title of which was A More Perfect Union, then-Senator Obama connected the politics of race to a broader narrative of liberal multicultural nationalism, a strategy he'd used so effectively in 2004 at the Democratic National Convention when he gave the keynote address. The Constitution speech was a masterful performance of politics that changed the dynamic of the presidential primary contest and which many people said secured for Mr. Obama the presidency. In that speech, Mr. Obama emphatically rejected the idea that white racism is endemic to American public life. He contested the notion that racial injustice and inequality are integral permanent features of our national identity and he offered up the story of his own life as exhibit in chief. He said to the audience in Philadelphia, and I'm quoting him here, I am the son of a black man from Kenya and a white woman from Kansas. He then fused the personal and the political in a startling turn of phrase. My story, he said, has seared into my genetic makeup the idea that this nation is more than the sum of its parts, that out of many we are truly one. Since his election to the presidency, Mr. Obama's remarks on the topic of race have typically hewed, at least uh, in the first six years of his presidency, to um, a theme which might be captured as follows. We have different stories but common hopes. That was his central strategy. We are different, but we are fundamentally the same. Uh, in, in a way, it's a rhetorical um, picture of the Latin statement, e pluribus unum, out of many one. Right? And this racial liberalism has served him very well. So he's followed the script of every Democrat in rhetorical terms who's occupied the White House in the post-civil rights era, but he's also done something more and different. What makes Mr. Obama's 
rhetorical presidency so unique is the bold, confident use of his personal history and even the person of his own body to explain and defend his vision of America as a liberal, multicultural body politic. Interpreted rhetorically then, President Obama's speech in 2008, his vision of our nation's body politics can be read as a kind of post-modern democratic reimagining of the legal fiction that Tudor lawyers famously fashioned from the medieval political theology of the king's two bodies. Right? So this is an idea uh, that I'm trying to apply in the context of the rhetorical presidency uh, that understands Mr. Obama's rhetorical strategy, his rhetorical presidency as an elaboration for a democratic post-monarchical culture of the idea associated um, with the two bodies metaphor that the king has two bodies because he has two capacities, the one whereof is a body natural consisting of natural members as every other man has. And in this he is subject to passions and death as other men are. The other is a body politic and the members thereof are his subjects and he and his subjects together compose the corporation. This is Plowden. Now, this doctrine of the future president's two bodies, or more precisely, of one body that bears the twin metaphorical marks of blackness and whiteness, of Kenya and Kansas, points in two but related directions. On the first, most visceral level, there's a kind of shock induced by the image of the body of our then future president. Um, it creates a moment, however fleeting, in which the listener is invited to envision his or her own embodied person as a reflection and as a living repository of America's corporate political identity and existence. To belong to America, then, is not merely to be a member of the American body politic, but a member of the imagined community, to use Benedict Anderson's phrase, that is the nation. On a second, more abstract level, the symbolically branded body seared into my DNA. What a vivid image. The symbolically branded body of Barack Obama offers an inchoate codification of the post-racial society that he has consistently, though often ambivalently insisted, that America has not yet become. So um, here I might talk to you about an image from U.S. case law, the decision of the Supreme Court in 1978 in Bakke versus the University of California Regents, the famous uh, and first uh, in a line of famous cases having to do with affirmative action, in which then Justice Lewis Powell argued that the United States was a country of minorities. Uh, we are a nation of minorities, he said, uh, each of whom has fought to find its way into the national mainstream. But Obama has ethnicized race because he did something that no president, except one who could claim to represent in his very body the national idea of America, could do. Right? There are two narratives in the United States. Um, one is a narrative of minorities as immigrants, right? And it goes through Ellis Island. Right? Uh, we are a nation on this account of immigrants, each of whom has fought our way into the American body politic. But race has never been a synonym in the United States for ethnicity because race has been uniquely I'm tempted to say exceptionally associated in the American imagination with blackness. That is to say, not Ellis Island, right, but the slave ships crossing from Africa in the Middle Passage to Jamestown, and then from Jamestown throughout the rest of the country. Race and ethnicity have never been the same. By fusing in the person of his very body 
the racial narrative of African American identity and the ethnic narrative of immigrant identity, President Obama was able to ethnicize race and do something that no president before him had done in a liberal, multicultural narrative of ethnic race, right? um, a narrative that um, has sutured, if you will, to use a medical term, has sutured African Americans into the American dream because there's a sense in which even though we were citizens and members of the U.S. nation state, we were never members, full members of the American family. The family which is defined not so much by the nation or by one's official legal status as a citizen in relationship to the state, right? but to that mystical imagined community. Uh, let's call it America as opposed to the United States. Obama has brilliantly uh, invited the American um, people into a distinctive vision in which ethnicity and race are not opposed, but they converge on this idea of ethnic race. I am a son of a black man from Kansas, a black man from Kenya and a white woman from Kansas, raised with the help of a white grandfather and a white grandmother. I am married to a black American who carries within her the blood of slaves and slave owners, an inheritance we pass on to our two precious daughters. I have brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, uncles and cousins of every race and every hue scattered across three continents. No president in the history of the American presidency could lay claim to this personal narrative in a way that made his personal narrative central to the national narrative of what it means to belong, in Kenneth Carr's vivid phrase, to belong to America. For as long as I live, I will never forget that in no other country is my story even possible. It's a story that hasn't made me a conventional candidate, but it is a story that has seared into my genetic makeup the idea that this nation is more than the sum of its parts, that out of many, we are truly one. The second move, about which I will talk very briefly, is <coughs> one that I've described as the moralizing of race, or as a species of, or politics of, racial moralism. Uh, perhaps the most vivid instance of pr uh, President Obama's racial moralism came in uh, 2009 in a speech uh, that he gave before the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, one of the oldest civil society organizations in the country dedicated to the cause of racial justice. And at its centennial convention, in New York City, uh, President Obama began his remarks with a litany of the challenges faced by the communities from which many of his listeners had come. He wrote, we know that even as our economic crisis batters Americans of all races, African Americans are out of work more than just about anybody else. We know that even as spiraling healthcare costs crush families of all races, African Americans are more likely to suffer from a host of diseases, but less likely to own health insurance than just about anybody else. We know that even as we imprison more people of all races than any nation in the world, one out of every four persons in the world who is incarcerated is an American. Um, an African American child is roughly five times as likely as a white child to see the inside of a prison. We know that even as the scourge of HIV AIDS devastates nations abroad, particularly in Africa, it is devastating the African American community here at home with disproportionate force. We know these things. So he acknowledges the pain of discrimination that is still felt in America in his words. He then went on to ask his audience to indulge him while he offered a few more detailed observations on the state of our schools. This was his first 
major speech on public education. Um, he wrote, noted actually, that the, the schools, the public schools, was where the story of the civil rights movement was written. So he noted that half a century after the Supreme Court's landmark decision in Brown versus the Board of Education, invalidating race-based segregation in public schools, the dream, he said, of a world-class education is still being deferred all across the country. The president then pointed up the higher dropout rates and lower grades and test scores in math and in reading among African American children. He called attention to the, quote, overcrowded classrooms and crumbling schools to which the children of poor Americans were consigned. Nonetheless, speaking to a black audience in a city where public schools are the most racially segregated in the United States, that's New York's um, ignominious claim to distinction, our schools in New York City, which never had official Jim Crow, are the most racially segregated schools in the entire United States. He insisted that the, the state of American schools was not an African American problem, it is an American problem. So why, on the president's account, ought the poor state of schools in the United States, to which disproportionate members, numbers of black and brown par parents um, um, send their children, be viewed as a problem that concerns all Americans? Now, one might have expected a president of the United States, who is a former teacher of constitutional law, to draw on the idea from Brown versus the Board of Education that educational inequity denies poor children of color access to the cultural values, to the cultural literacy, which are a prerequisite for effective participation in democ democratic society, or impedes their ability to claim the rights and, and to discharge the duties of democratic citizenship. Rather than framing issues of educational inequity as an issue of justice, though, uh, Mr. Obama makes it a question of morality, right? uh, not of the morality of the nation, right? uh, but of the moral will and the moral fortitude of individual students. Right? He says to the students, your destiny is in your hands. You cannot forget that. That's what we have to teach our children. No excuses, no excuses. We've got to say to our children, yes, if you're African American, the odds of growing up amid crime and gangs are higher. Yes, if you live in a poor neighborhood, you will face challenges that somebody in a wealthy suburb does not have to face. But that's not a reason to get bad grades. That's not a reason to cut class not a reason to give up on your education and drop out of school. No one has written your destiny for you. Right? Uh, so the language that he's drawing on here is a language with which Americans are quite familiar. It is the language of moral individualism, right? uh, of a kind of responsabilization in which the American dream is open to everyone and we fail or succeed because of our inner moral character, because of the content of our character, to paraphrase Martin Luther King Jr. Right? Social structures, social obstacles and the like are ultimately not decisive. Right? So these questions of racial uh, structure, of systemic or structural discrimination are taken off the table in favor of a kind of racial moralism, right, which sees not only uh, racism as essentially a moral problem, I fail if I'm racist to appreciate your equal moral personhood, but also sees the failure to overcome racism right, as a moral failure. Right? So this is an idea uh, of racial moralism, of race as moralism. Now it's quite closely tied, however, to the third and final conception of race that I'd like to associate with the Obama administration, and I call that market race. Mr. Obama 
has marketed race in an extraordinary way. I can use the 2009 speech to the NAACP uh, to demonstrate just how uh, that is the case. Right? So, I read a passage to you earlier in which he said, we hold our destinies in our hands. Right? So, rather than framing in that speech issues of educational inequity as issues of justice, what Mr. Obama offers us is a textbook neoliberal explanation of why unequal schooling, why unequal access to public schooling is not a problem principally that faces the African American community, but is an American problem. What are the terms in which he explains to his audience why we should see this not as a problem of race, but as a national problem that implicates all Americans? This is the president. If brown and black children cannot compete, then America cannot compete. So doubling down on his theme, President Obama insists that government programs alone won't get our children to the promised land. Instead, he argues, we need a new mindset, a new set of attitudes, and an end to the internalized sense of limitation which has led so many in our community to expect so little from the world and from themselves. How were black Americans to forge the new consciousness that would empower their children to overcome the small sense of self that was one of the most durable and destructive legacies of discrimination on the president's own words. The solution Mr. Obama offered to his audience in a way mirrors the fusing of ethnicity and race. He fuses racial moralism with a kind of uh, vision of uh, market um, initiative uh, and entrepreneurship. He says, what we need is to understand ourselves as market actors, right? We need to compete, right? So the solution he offers is a kind of neoliberalized version of racial uplift, whose ideological core I might call neoliberal respectability politics, in which democracy emerges as a synonym for capitalism. It's a belief in the, presence, in the president's words uh, that there is a connection between the freedom of the marketplace and freedom more generally. So this is a vision of racial politics in which civic freedom or political freedom is, if you will, economized, as it were, reduced to nothing more than the market freedom to compete. Right? And that's from the language uh, that, I, that, that I read to you earlier. He says, you get that education, all those hardships, crimes, gangs, poverty, bad schools will just make you stronger, but stronger in a particular economic market-oriented way because the strength that overcoming those hardships will inculcate in students is, on his own words, a strength that will make you, quote, better able to compete. And he finished the speech with his trademark phrase, yes, we can. Uh, so it's a fusing of moral individualism and market individualism, which is perfectly compatible with the new neoliberal order. The British writer Stuart Hall once said that one of the hallmarks of the neoliberal political economies that Margaret Thatcher in Great Britain and Ronald uh, Reagan in the United States were able to impose was a kind of high threshold of tolerance for inconsistency and incoherence. Uh, Reagan and Thatcher, he said, both appreciated and mastered the purely rhetorical and symbolic work of politics, spinning webs of words to paper over the deep contradictions between the theory and the practices of neoliberalism by reframing and reworking them through their rhetoric. So much the same can be said about the discursive strategies that characterized the rhetorical presidency of Barack Obama. The most stunning feature of the president's address that I've been uh, discussing with you here is the way it manages simultaneously 
to bring and to hold different and divergent ideas and images. Right? Thus, on the one hand, the president acknowledges the force of structural inequalities that still plague too many communities and are the object of national neglect. That's his word. On the other, he insists that the children of the black and brown poor who are trapped in what he calls corridors of shame um, have no excuses if they end up in the ranks of young men on the corners of Harlem or the south, the south side of, of Chicago. Right? This narrative of competition, of competitivization, um, in effect offers African Americans during one of the worst years of the Great Recession an image of civic freedom which is market freedom rather than political freedom. Right? Um, and is in that sense deeply, deeply anti-political. Now, like the larger neoliberal project it legitimates, a project which uh, began under Ronald Reagan, the racial neoliberal order over which President Obama has presided continues and consolidates a 30-year, three-decade-long economization of American politics. The withdrawal of the state from the lives of its citizens. The privatization of dependency through the retrenchment of welfare, social security, and the like. Right? Uh, the withdrawal of the state from education. Uh, the uh, privatization of basic functions, whether we're talking about uh, our armed forces right, uh, or whether we're talking about who runs our prisons. Right? That neoliberal turn, which has been decisive to American political culture, was consolidated or has been consolidated under the Obama presidency in ways uh, that I think uh, warrant a description of the Obama presidency as a neoliberal presidency in a different color. Now race has always been foundational um, both as a feature of capitalism um, and of capitalism American style. But racial neoliberalism marks a new stage in the history of racial capitalism. Um, and President Obama has presided uh, over uh, this process in which the economic and political market value of race in today's ethno-racial moment in the United States. Um, consider in this regard, I don't know whether you use this language here in uh, Canada, uh, but we have in the United States, largely in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision in uh, the Baki case, created a cottage industry, not a cottage industry, it is a huge industry that centers around what we refer to as diversity, right? Uh, and the branding, the corporate branding of diversity as a good that can be market, marketed and monetized uh, and which really replaces discussions of social justice, right? That's the moment in which we live. Race has become a market value in the neoliberal market state, or in what uh, Sheldon Wolin, the Princeton uh, political theorist, has called democracy managed. Uh, and it has also introduced a kind of neoliberalization of black citizenship, in which the deep and uh, long uh, historic uh, movement to claim in the language of social justice full and equal civic dignity of black and brown populations has been replaced by a thin, uh, almost anti-political rhetoric of belonging to the market. Right? Um, at the same time, we have seen a criminalization of the idea of black citizenship and constitutional political agency. Uh, I will give you this example. Uh, in closing, consider in this regard, from the point of view of the culture of constitutional politics, the birther movement, with which I hope uh, you are familiar. Our birther in chief, um, uh, I'll introduce in a second. The idea comes from the U.S. Constitution, Article 2, 
uh, Section 1, Clause 5, which reads, no person except a natural born citizen, that's, that's my sign that I have five minutes, uh, no person except a natural born citizen shall be eligible to the office of the president. Um, our birther in chief, Mr. Trump, um, who really found his national representation right, in being the face, the literal face of the birther movement and a kind of counter-revolution right, to the multicultural uh, nationalism that Mr. Obama represents, um, has uh, over the years really branded himself uh, as uh, the chief skeptic in the United States of Mr. Obama's constitutional bona fides. He's challenged the very idea of the legitimacy of the Obama presidency in a sense by declaring the person of Barack Obama himself illegitimate. Right? Uh, he's not American. Right? He's not one of us right? um, and has set for himself the task of uh, of discrediting the very claim uh, of Mr. Obama to the office of the presidency, right? So in a kind of a perverse uh, deformation of the idea of the president's two bodies. Uh, he's saying the guy wasn't born here and therefore he's a fraud. Uh, with Barack Obama listing himself as born in Kenya in 1999, uh, laws allowed him to produce a fake certificate an extremely credible source has called my office and told me that Barack Obama's birth certificate is a fraud. How amazing the state health director who verified copies of Obama's birth certificate died in plane crash today. All others lived, right? So Mr. Obama himself becomes a kind of criminal. By the way, um, Mr. Obama was not alone in these charges. Uh, he also leveled these charges against uh, Mr. Ted Cruz. Uh, citing, among others, uh, the constitutional law expert, uh, Professor Lawrence Tribe of Harvard, uh, who says it's wrong to read the language in the constitutional provision that I put up on the board uh, that refers to natural born citizens as a settled matter. It isn't. Uh, Ted Cruz's poll numbers are, big, uh, are down big because he was born in Canada and was until recently a Canadian citizen. Many believe he cannot run. And finally, if Ted Cruz does not clean up his act, stop cheating and doing negative ads, I have standing to sue him for not being a natural born citizen. Um, that criminalization of black and brown citizenship dovetailed perfectly with what we've seen in the last few years, which has been almost an epidemic of violence targeted against the bodies of young black and brown men and women. Trayvon Martin, uh, whom um, President Obama said, when Trayvon Martin was first shot, I said that this could have been my son. Another way of saying that is Trayvon Martin could have been me 35 years ago. Uh, Eric Garner, who was brutally killed by the police in uh, my own city. Uh, and on and on and on and on and on. So during the Obama presidency, we have seen this spectacle of violence. Um, of violence justified largely uh, by representations, semiotic and otherwise, of black and brown bodies as criminal bodies. We've seen the criminalization, if you will, of black citizenship. Uh, and that violence, which has expressed itself in literal uh, death, uh, has become part of our, not just of our police culture of policing, but of our political culture uh, at uh, the rallies that Mr. Trump has held, uh, in which followers of Mr. Trump have not hesitated uh, to beat sometimes bloody persons whom they have viewed as political, not just political foes, but political enemies, taking us back uh, to the period of the 50s and 60s in which this kind of racist violence in civil society was part of our constitutional politics, the everyday life, if you will, of American constitutional politics. So some of you may know that President uh, Obama visited 
a federal prison earlier this year, the first sitting president ever to do so. He toured the prison and he talked with residents of the prison, people who were part of what has come to be known as the prison industrial complex. Uh, and um, I think that moment marks a shift. I think that moment marks a shift. If the Obama presidency represents a moment of constitutional transformation, uh, in which the divide between ethnicity and race in the American imagination has been closed. Okay. Uh, I think that neoliberal project of bringing African Americans and other people of color uh, into the national economy uh, and into the neoliberal market identity of America uh, has has had to confront the realities of violence right. uh, and uh, the, 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 the durable character uh, of, above all, of the discourse of black criminality right. um, and this idea that black citizenship is criminal citizenship. If we're not uh, murdering and mugging, we're trying to commit voter fraud, right. uh, thus the rise of uh, state laws that have made it increasingly hard for people to exercise the franchise. Uh, last year, to mark the 50th anniversary of the Great March to Selma, Mr. Obama addressed the nation uh, and said that the struggle of African Americans to secure the right to vote was a contest to determine the true meaning of America, a contest, if you will, over and about the content of our symbolic constitution. He spoke with uh, the Edmund Pettus Bridge behind him, across which um, a reenactment of the march in 1965 uh, was staged. Uh, and he introduced an idea which I would submit to you is both the challenge and the opportunity that faces U.S. constitutional culture today. That is, to move from ideas of ethnic race, of moral race, and of neoliberal market race to an understanding of race as a political category, something which we have never quite been able to do uh, because of the hold on the American imagination of the idea that racism in the United States in legal uh, uh, form, but uh, more generally, societal discrimination is a moral problem rather than a political problem. Right? Um, not a problem of democratic and political justice, but a problem of interpersonal prejudice and misunderstanding. This concept of political race would, in contrast to the ethnicizing of race, the moralizing of race, and uh, the market, neoliberal marketizing of race, politicize race, but in a way that does not cling to identity. Right? Uh, so political race has nothing to do with skin color. And here I draw on the definition of professors Lonnie Guineer and Gerald Torres, who write that political race refers to a group of people who are defined by their politics, not their physiognomy but who do not deny race. Political race acknowledges racial unfairness, but does so uh, not by relying on phenotypic identity, skin color, the shape of your nose, the texture of your hair, as the reason to capture social goods or fix political resources. Instead, race becomes an organized space, a political space for organized resistance around a more transformative vision of the good society. Right? Um, that concept of political race and of a racial public whose members are not defined by how they look but to, by the vision of justice to which they are committed uh, can be seen, for example, in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, it can be seen um, even in an apparently uh, frivolous leisure activity like professional football with Colin Kaepernick. Uh, who has captured the imagination of the entire nation with the simple act of kneeling 
uh, in a gesture of grief and sorrow uh, during the playing of the national anthem, of these young boys who put to the nation the question in the face of the epidemic of anti-black violence at the hands of police and others, am I next? And who insist on the relevance and integrity of a simple declarative statement that black lives matter. Right? This transformation in American constitutional politics um, is perhaps uh, best described as an effort at what my constitutional law professor, um, Bruce Ackerman, called informal constitutional amendments. That is to say, um, a, a secular change, uh, a radical change uh, in the, the, the national imagination right, um, of our basic vision of what it means to belong to America. That's the struggle that's going on in the United States. And um, um, it is arguably uh, one of the things that is at stake uh, in uh, the uh, election cycle that will culminate in my country on November 8th. You have these two warring forces, these two uh, deeply contested visions of, of what it means to belong to America in the age of post-race. Uh, and uh, the constitutional significance of this may not be openly or explicitly voiced in opinions by the Supreme Court or by lower courts or in the briefs that are filed by lawyers in the cases that the court uh, hears, uh, but they are crucial to the way that Americans imagine themselves in relationship to one another. They are central to what uh, might be called our imaginal politics. And the question for me is whether uh, we will march forward into an era um, in the age after Obama of a kind of poverty, imaginative poverty, or whether we will lay claim uh, to that larger and broader vision of the United States uh, as a country in which uh, citizenship is not the name uh, for the supremacy of one powerful group uh, over uh, another. Thank you very much for uh, being here. I've enjoyed uh, this opportunity to share these thoughts with you. Thank you.